I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about sex and romance. So there's that. <laughs> Title of my message is The Problem with Pineapples. I uh, released a book this year called Swipe Right, um, and it was really the result. Yeah, you could, it was a lot of work. You could awkwardly clap for that. Um, the book's called Swipe Right, and it was the result of, um, of a message that God's put on Jenny and I on this kind of life and death power of sex and romance that we've been preaching for 12 years. Since Jen and I got married, really almost immediately we began feeling a burden for uh, letting people know God has a better plan for your sex life than the devil does. And really, um, when I wrote the book, it was not like, oh, what do I write next? It was more like, I felt like to not put this pen to paper on this would be sin for me because we felt such a great burden, almost like to where God said, if you don't, I'm going to hold the blood on your hands of those who needed to hear this, but you didn't give it to them. And you, you, when you feel that way, you just got to do it. And, and, um, and so we released that book, and the title Swipe Right, and um, you're like, what, what does that even mean, Swipe Right? Well, let's, for, let's back up for a second and just acknowledge that we live in a day where a lot of swiping is happening. Can we just acknowledge that? A lot of swipe. There's a lot of swiping going on. Um, they say we touch our phones 150 times a day on average. 150 times a day, which breaks down to once every six minutes. Or in the, the course of a normal day during this sermon, you would grab for your phone five to six times, which is a lot and disturbing if you think about it. Um, they say we're doing it so often, many of us are developing something called phantom vibration sensation, where you feel your phone buzz because you just got a text, you're, or you're sure you did, so you grab it. There's no text there. Mystery texter, where'd you go? Right? There's, there's no Instagram like. There's no YouTube play. There's no comment on anything. You just thought your phone. Honesty in church, who's ever had that happen? That's scary, what we're doing to ourselves on the inside, right? But no, we don't really even know because the paint's dry. I mean, the internet's only been around as long as those of us who are 30 are old. So, like, we have no blooming clue what we're actually. We are lab rats in a grand global experiment. I mean, certainly it's not making us better at conversation. Right? Cash me outside. How about that? I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, it's like, what in the world are we talking about? Like, we're not getting better at driving. Uh, we're not becoming more creative and expressive. Our attention spans are not getting longer, I, I, I don't think. And, and how does this uh, butt into uh, re relationships? Well, in a lot of different ways. This is bringing sexuality into our lives. They say 36% of the internet is porn. Let that sink in. That's almost, that's, that's a lot. I was going to say it's almost half, but my statistics and numbers, I would just, that's almost half. Get it? Um, they say one out of four Google searches is sexual in, 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 in nature. One out of four. And, uh, and of course, then there's, there's, there's dating apps. Now, it started with you know, eHarmony and, and Match.com and, and people look, more or less looking for someone to date, looking for someone like, I want to find someone to that person. I want to find the one. But now with dating apps, the purpose is shifting. It's not really even finding someone to date or marry. It's really just finding someone to be with just for the evening. The, 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 the advent of really the, the disposable relationship. Um, they say there's about 100 million users on these mobile dating apps now. Half of that on Tinder, the 800-pound gorilla in the game, the one that brought the swiping functionality to the experience. And, and so if, if you don't know, uh, or if you want to pretend like you have no clue, just, just look at me like, whoa, that's crazy. What Tinder? How do you even spell that? Pro tip, put your phone on silent. You get a Tinder notification while I'm preaching this sermon, you're going straight to hell. I am telling you right now, I'm warning you, you've been warned, right? So uh, Tinder brings up a profile of somebody, a photo of somebody, and then a, a brief biography, 500 words, full of true statements about who you really are and your character and your integrity and your values and all of that. And, uh, and, and you read stuff, and, and then you swipe left if you're not interested. You swipe right if you are. And though maybe it's not how it was originally intended, or maybe it was, but how it's principally being used is by people looking to have sex with someone just for the evening with no intention of any relationship beyond that. And uh, it's, it's not uncommon in big cities uh, like, uh, like New York, LA, Charlotte, Kalispell, Montana, just the raging metropolises of the, of the land. By the way, pray for us. We just opened our first location in Oregon, uh, and we have one in Utah now, in 
January, we're opening in Wyoming. So if you know anybody in Jackson area, let them know. Uh, we're just having so much fun also in Montana. But, but it's not uncommon among, among the young people, you know, young graphic designer, attorney, whatever, career-minded, not wanting the drama of a relationship, but still having needs, you know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and so to fire up the app, and in the words of one mobile uh, dater who I read about in Vanity Fair magazine, that, that all men are looking for today is to hit it and quit it. They fire up the app so they can hit it and quit it. I read one young man saying, I could go to a bar, I could go to a club, but I, I could just open the app up and I can know pretty sure in an hour or two I could be having sex with someone and then back on my way like it never happened. This is what's happening. It's a huge shift. They say in human history, this is one of the two biggest movements in how we've approached mating and, and the ritual of romance. The other one was when we stopped being nomadic and settled down in farming communities. So like it's, there's a lot happening in our culture today. And my message in, in the book is it's not like, okay, let's quit swiping, right? That's like the church's overreaction. Like, okay, everybody, throw your phones in the pile. We're going to burn them, right? No, no, that's it. D- denim overalls. We're making our own butter. Come on, everyone to Montana. Let's go. <laughs> like, that's not the message. You know, is we, how, how could we reach a world that we abandon, right? How many of you are thankful that we're preaching the gospel on the internet right now? That, that we can, so we're not going to abandon the world. Is this, that's not the idea. Here, here's the mess. Here's, here's, a, here's a thought. Let's swipe right. Not left right, wrong right. There's a wrong way to live. There's a right way to live. How many of you know that if we look up, we can swipe right? That will be doing what Moses failed to do. Exodus 2.12. This is the kind of metaphor I use in the book where Moses, look at the text. It says, he looked this way, looked that way. Seeing no one, he did something he felt like doing. Killed the Egyptian, hid the body in the sand. The problem is when we just look to the right to culture, just look to the left to our friends, just look to the media, we got to look up. What does heaven think? What does God want us to do? How does God who made us want us to live our lives? How can we do justly, love mercy, walk humbly before. We got to look up so we can, we can swipe right. Now let's back up here. I'm talking about sex, bringing this all up. I, you should see some of your faces, by the way, like this is intense. Um, maybe you, you're new to church and you, you, you're, you're, you're a different church background than Elevation and you're not quite frankly used to pastors talking about real stuff. You're like, what the heck's happening here? Uh, and let me just apologize on behalf of many of us who as pastors spend most of our time answering questions that no one's asking. You know, you're, you're, you're struggling with debt, addicted to pornography. The pastor's up here trying to tell you about who the Antichrist is. You know, that, that's great for Gog and Magog, uh, be that as it may, but I got real issues here. And, uh, and, and, and so I think we need to speak to these things because how many of you know this book has a whole lot to say about the real issues that are facing our lives, devastating our homes, breaking up our marriages, and messing with our children. So what, what, what do we need to know about God's plan for sex? Uh, here we go. God wants you to have amazing sex. Uh, newsflash, I thought more of you would be excited about that. I, sex is really good. It feels great. I've had a lot of it. It's, we got five kids, guys. Uh, so if the day goes well, I might even have some more. It's awesome. And God's for that. He's not opposed to sex. It's, he's not ashamed of it. He, he invented it. Right? Like the devil loves to like act like it's his idea. And God's like, I got the patent for that on the wall in my office. What are you talking about? You see it in the in the book of Genesis, you know? Adam's there hanging out by himself. He's naming animals, just which by the way, was our first job. A creative assignment. To give a name, to speak something over something God had built. And uh, whatever Adam called it, that's what its name was. And you have that same life and death in the power of your tongue, what you choose to speak over someone. You can call them good for nothing, or you can call them loved by God. And what you speak over someone is what lingers over them. And uh, so there's a power to it. But Adam was lonely. And, and so God knew he needed to bring uh, Eve to Adam. So he caused a deep sleep to fall over him. Adam wakes up. There she is, Eve. Hey, when did you get here? Just a moment ago. Out of your rib, actually, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, uh, and Adam was excited. God the Father had brought the bride away, given her away at the first wedding. And then he, as the pastor, conducted the first wedding ceremony in human history. And, and Adam was excited. We, I can prove to you Adam was excited because he wrote a poem. And a guy has to be really excited to resort to poetry. Like, <laughs> it's actually in the Bible, the poem. It's, it's bone of my bone. Scandalous. Flesh of my flesh? If you translate that from the original Hebrew, it's if you had a twin, I would still choose you, girl. You thought Bars and Battles was over. Oh, no. 
Adam, Adam's the original gangster rapper. I mean, it's like apple bottom jeans and the boots with the fur. It's what he said about Eve right then and there, back then in the OT, right? And God wasn't offended. He wasn't like, Adam, right? I mean, he brought the guy a naked wife. I think he knew what was going to happen next. Just, just saying. And um, so, so listen, God is not against you having sex. The problem isn't you having a sex drive. The problem is when you let sex drive. It's when you do whatever you feel. It's you give into your every impulse. My, my thesis is that if sex is God-given, it should be God-governed. He gives it to us. He should, we should look to him to tell us how to get the most out of it, right? So, so what did God say about how to use sex? Well, he said in Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that's how I intend for you to use this gift of sex that's pleasurable but also powerful. If you leave it in the marriage bed, you'll get the most out of it. But if you take it out of the arena in which I intended for you to use it, you're going to hurt yourself. Sex is not just pleasurable, it's also powerful. Ironically, once God tells us how to use what he invented and gave to us as a gift, that's where we cop an attitude. <laughs> Whatever. Doesn't want me to have any fun. Like, but when do you use that logic anywhere else? Go to Home Depot, buy a chainsaw, see all the manuals? Like, Whatever. They don't want me to have any fun. <laughs> no, you just intuitively know. They don't want you to chop your freaking arm off, right? Like, we assume the best positive intent on Home Depot, but get all huffy with God who made us, as though he doesn't know anything that we don't know. Y'all, I'm 35 years old. God doesn't even have a birthday. I figure there's a few things he knows that I don't know. And so rather than arrogantly puffing up our chests and stiffening our neck and saying, my will be done, I think we ought to humbly bow our knee and say, thy will be done. That's a better way to live your life life. So, so here's what God knows that you need to know. When you take what he's told you not to touch, it can keep him from being able to give you what he wanted you to have all along. See everything that happened in the Garden of Eden as proof, right? But so it is when it comes to sexuality. It's like pineapples. Uh, this here is uh, your common garden variety pineapple. Now, none of you oohed and awed and gasped when I brought that out of the tiny crate under that chair. But there was a day when this would have absolutely blown you away to see a pineapple with your own eyes. You see, they were discovered by Europeans in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And I know it's a drama right now. Los Angeles just disowned him. But like, here's the thing. When Columbus came to the New World, these pineapples, which had grown in South America but had then been transplanted to the Caribbean, they had never been seen by any European eyes. And they were, they were dumbfounded by this mysterious fruit that was shaped like a pine cone but juicy on the inside like a golden apple. So they called it a pineapple, and he brought it back to Europe. Everybody freaked out. All the royalty, all the kings, the who's who of Europe had to get their hands on a pineapple. So they would be brought over by the ships that would cross the Atlantic Ocean, and people basically went nuts over them to the extent that at the height of the pineapple craze, it would have been the ultimate status symbol of a lifetime to have a pineapple in your possession. They were sold in today's currency at the height for $8,000 for a single pineapple. This informed art. This informed architecture. When Christopher Wren designed St. Paul's Cathedral in London, look at the top. What did he put on the top of it? A golden pineapple. They're all over London. They're all over Europe. Y'all thought just it was a Williams and Sonoma symbol of hospitality. That's how it eventually became. But it was power. It was prestige. You, many people couldn't get their hands on an actual pineapple that they would own themselves. So they, they had rental services where you could rent it for the day. You would just rent it. What would you do with it? You couldn't eat it. No, no, no. You could, if you eat it, you bought it, y'all. You would have it in your home, and you would have a party, and it would be a viewing party, where at some point in the night, they would reveal the pineapple. And all the guests would see. You're like, those old people are so dumb. You know, what do you think they would think about us just sitting around staring at our Netflix all the time? Ooh, Instagram, right? We think they're crazy looking at a pineapple. I think it's probably more relaxing and better for your soul. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> So here's, here's what's crazy about this. This obsession went on for a couple hundred years, but then eventually the demand caused the industrious to realize, I can make a quick buck. So the pineapple plantations started popping up all over Hawaii. Dole got their action on, and the steamship made it easier to get more and more and more and more and more and more across to Europe to the people that wanted it. And of course, as the supply went up, 
the demand went down to the point that now we have pineapple chunks. <laughs> Guys, we've gone from a masterpiece and a work of art to chunks. <laughs> to chunks. <laughs> but but here, stay, stay with me. Stay with me. Here, here, here's the thing. This is not something to ogle. This is not something to put on top of a building. This is not something that anybody's impressed by. This is not the ultimate symbol of luxury and privilege, because something that's wide available to everybody is hotly desired by nobody. And so it is with sex. I guess sex with everyone is kind of the same as sex with no one. It's just pineapple chunks to be speared one click at a time on your laptop, swipe through one person at a time. You see, what, 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 what makes sex so special, what makes sex so amazing is it was meant to be this ultra-guarded experience that out of a whole world, there was one person that you were naked and vulnerable before. It was an ultra-exclusive club, so much so that it only had one member in the whole world. That's just this one guarded experience that's to be treasured, that's to be valued. That's what God intends for you to have when it comes to your sexual experience. That's his plan. All right, I want to take the, the time that remains and expose three lies about sex. If you take notes in church, three lies about sex that maybe, just maybe, you have believed. This is what culture tells us on the subject. Number one, this is so important. Jot this down. If you, if you take notes in church, get it. If you don't, write it on your neighbor's leg. Just do it. They need it more. If you see anybody not writing this stuff down, just write it on their leg, right? Um, because, and by the way, parents, part of the reason I wrote this book and I'm preaching this is, is I want to help you transform an awkward talk with your kid into a life-giving dialogue that points to wise choices. Not one talk, an ongoing conversation that points to wise choices. All right, here's the first lie. Sex is just a physical activity. This is what our culture tells us. When I was in middle school, there was this band called The Bloodhound Gang, and they had this song it went like this. You and me, baby, we ain't nothing but mammals, so let's just do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> and I remember that song because I feel like it's, I, I had respect for it. It's an honest articulation of a secular, humanistic perspective on sexuality. If there's no God, then we're just smart monkeys wearing pants drinking lattes. So really what we do, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, sex is just biological. So as long as you're making sure to not reproduce any, if you don't want to, and, and it's consensual, then, then really go nuts. What does it matter? And that's more and more how millennials and younger view sexuality. It's just physical. Physical. It's just your body. It's just basically, you know, two people coming together. It's just an appetite. So no big deal. But here, here's what the Bible says. Ah. God, who invented sex, tells us this. Sex involves you on the deepest possible level. Hear me. It involves you on the deepest possible level. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 6, put it this way. There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As it is written, the two become one. The danger of sexuality is that it's not just your body you're bringing to the table. You're mingling your soul with another person's soul. And in some mysterious level, the two become one. Now, obviously, Adam and Eve weren't Siamese twins after the Garden of Eden, right? They, 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 so the two becoming one wasn't a physical union. So God's obviously talking about something invisible that takes place. So, so hear me carefully. Sex involves your heart involves your soul, it involves your mind, and it changes you. The experience changes you. You don't walk away from it the same person that you were. You can't glue two things together and then tear them apart and have it be like it never was. There's always going to be residue. There's always going to be an impact. So, so just those of you who are just living that way and you're like, no, no, it's good, it's good, it's good, you would say to me, it's safe sex. I would say to you, there isn't a condom big enough to fit over your soul. So what you're doing to yourself, it's more than meets the eye. So even if no one gets pregnant, even even if no one gets HPV, I'm telling you, it's doing something to you on the inside on an invisible level. Even the CDC says this. I mean, the CDC says regular porn users and those who have a previous history of lots of partners, they experience higher rates of depression, lower rates of physical health. The New York Post just ran an article on Tinder in New York, because in that city, 60% uh, of women and 80% of men who are 18 to 24 are on Tinder. I mean, it's crazy. One out of five people at a music festival this year were, was on Tinder. And they're saying that as it's been escalating, sexual addiction and dysfunction has been skyrocketing. 
They're seeing more and more obsessive behavior. People who are deleting the app, reinstalling it, deleting the app, just one more time, and then I'll be getting twitchy. Someone called it the crack cocaine of our time, Tinder. I'm talking about Tinder, but pornography, same thing. Lights have the same centers of the brain as heroin. And they're also seeing just depression. And here's what was most interesting to me. They're seeing an inability to maintain meaningful relationships after the fact. Any long-term relationship becomes very difficult because the instant gratification became so easy. But isn't that what Paul said if we continue on in 1 Corinthians 6? He said, since we want to become spiritually one with the master, Jesus, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy. What will that do? It'll leave us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. You see, when you just use the physical side of sex, you manipulate the physical side of sex to the exclusion of any other aspect of it. What it can do is cause you to become numb on the inside in the parts of sex that are then wanting to come to life and be a source of beauty and strength and long lasting when you get to the relationship you you then want to stay in. You'll find that sex is like a post-it note, and the more times you've stuck it, the less sticky it becomes. And that's why our second lie that needs to be exposed is this. Here's the lie. I can do what I want and have what God wants. This is the lie of the bachelor party. The lie that says, you can come to the end of your wild years and you can mark the party with a big bonfire and one last trip to the strip club. And then (laughs) there's parents covering kids' ears. There's e-kids. Listen, there's... there's, (laughs) There's this line in the sand. It's like, now that's done. Now that's all done away with. I've gotten it. I've got, here we go. How do we say it? I've gotten it all out of my. Y'all, you don't get anything out of your system by doing it. You put it in your system. Where it's there in your system to help or hurt you down the road. It's so important that we understand what we're doing right now is the present. And one day your present will become your past. And your past has a pesky way of showing up in your future for good and for evil. The things that we do, they live on. Paul put it this way. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, the same he shall reap. The same he shall reap. The same he shall reap. All God's people said, the same shall he reap. You can't sow wild oats and then not reap that wild fruit. You can't sow sin and reap blessing. You can't sow death and reap life. The same that you put into the ground is what's going to come out of the ground. Young people, right now is the time to live for God. That's why I'm going to preach at Rhythm Nights. Y'all should come. I'm going to talk about how you got to seek your creator In the days of your, it's so important that we understand the things that we're doing. Are they going to bless us? What are we seeing in the fruit of this church? We're seeing the result of a young man who at a young age, God got a hold of his heart. God got a hold of Holly's heart. And they have fought for honor. And they have lived pure. And right now, we are seeing the fruit of the root that was planted all those years. And I wonder if you all understand that right now, you're living in the years that you'll be taught. This is your monk's corner era. What are you doing now? How are you living for righteousness now? How are you doing? things now that you're going to say thank you down the road for how you lived? Or are you giving yourself a headache down the road? Now, are you, listen, are you pushing back on this? I bet someone in Roanoke is. You're like, oh no, oh no, pastor, guy, dude, pal, if that is your real name. I can ask forgiveness down the road and God will forgive me. I'll just say sorry. That's your, that's your parachute. That's your ripcord. It's your, it's your ejector seat. Enough analogies. It's, it's your way out. You're like, I'm just going to do this now. So I'm, 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 this is my young. I can be free and do what I want and have a good time. Don't judge my journey. And then eventually I will say sorry and God will forgive me. And listen, I'll say to you this. Of course he will. Of course he will. You want something that will blow your mind? If you're in Christ, he already has. He's already forgiven you for stuff you haven't even done yet. Right? But there's a difference between forgiveness and consequences. So yes, he will forgive you, but he'd much rather be blessing you and using you than forgiving you. Who told you that God's highest good was just to forgive you of sin he didn't want you to commit in the first place? He'd rather be blessing you. He'd rather be using you. He'd rather be having his Holy Spirit come upon you. He'd rather be having you be used to drive the devil out of your school and to be raising righteous kids and to be thriving in your business and inventing things and writing songs and writing horses and other things. His highest good isn't just to forgive you. 
Here's what, listen, here's what the devil doesn't want you to know. Your desires can keep you from your destiny. Your desires can keep you from God's best for your life. And that's why the author of Hebrews, he, he put it this way. Watch out for the Esau syndrome. Someone say, watch out for the Esau syndrome. Trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You know well how Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing. But by then, it was too late. Tears or no tears. You know the story. Jacob has the soup. Esau has the birthright. Esau wants the soup. Jacob wants the birthright. And so for something that just felt good for a night, for swiping right on a good time, he traded away some far off promise of future pleasure for something that felt future power for some pleasure that would feel good here and now. And that's so easy to do. Why? Because now yells louder. But I came to tell you, later lasts longer. So don't trade what you want most for what would feel good right now. Instant gratification will keep you from ultimate satisfaction. You, you can't just do what you want and have what God wants. So what you have to do is you have to zoom out. Zoom out on Friday night. Zoom out on prom. Zoom out on homecoming and look at the bigger picture. And, and y'all single people. How many, how many single people in here right now? Listen, listen, don't play the field, reach the world. Don't play the field, reach the world. Use your single years to pour yourself into the kingdom. Y'all got to work your little window. This is your single, you have, you have more disposable time and resource. Pour yourself into the kingdom. And as you do, you're going to be becoming a different version of yourself every day. And you attract what you are. So as you seek first the kingdom of God, you'll attract something better because you'll be something different. Who you'll attract down the road as you run in your lane fighting for the kingdom, well, who you'll attract to be a whole different version than who you would have attracted had you settled over here, the bait you catch him with is the bait you'll have to keep him with. There's always going to be forbidden fruit. So if you give in, if you keep that boyfriend by giving more and more and more of yourself, taking off more and more and more of your clothes, sending more and more of those pictures, one out of five teenagers in America has sent some sexually explicit picture. So if you send these things to keep, that's what's going to have to keep them. You're, they're telling you what they have an appetite for. So what's going to happen when you're married and you, your figure changes a little bit and there's someone at work, listen, you, they've told you they have a taste for the forbidden fruit. So that's the point. The point is, is they're going to be exactly as faithful to you in marriage as they were with you before marriage. You're the forbidden fruit right now. It always shifts. It always changes. So we, what we need is a revelation of grace that changes how we view temptation. A revelation of, of grace will change it. So our mentality won't be, I can do all I want and just ask God for forgiveness later. No, we learned, we learned good that the grace that we have in our mind will actually cause us to grind even harder. We're going to give ourselves even more to God, knowing that the grace that he gave us, that he purchased for us with his, come on, celebrate the grace that he paid for your sin, that Jesus hung on the cross, and that makes you want to work it. That makes you want to get after it, living a holy life, not to earn his approval, but because you already have it. Now, I can hear... I can hear some of you, what you're thinking, what you're saying. I can see some of the crossed arms. And it's not all of you hatred. Some of you, it's just sadness. And, and, and I've been preaching this message a long time, and I've heard a lot of responses. And the saddest was a woman in Dallas who came up to me, probably 70, 80 years old. And this little old lady, she came up to me, and she, she grabbed my hands, and she said, son, if I'd have heard this message 50 years ago, you could have saved me 50 years of regret. And that brings up the third lie. And the third lie is this. I've already messed up, so there's no hope for me. I've already eaten the soup, Levi. That ship has sailed. I had soup. I had soup to go. I have a crock pot in my car. I, <laughs> I have had, man. <laughs> you know who that reminds me of? Samson. Talk about soup eater. That guy. Croutons coming out of his nose, you know. But it's a salad. What am I talking about? <laughs> Oyster crackers on the clam chowder, whatever. Samson, man, he, you see the, the devastation of consequences on his life. His eyes poked out, spiritual vision, which is what God does not want to happen to you. You want your spiritual vision dimmed. He wants you to know you are destined for impact. You are anointed and appointed to take your place and change the world, to be a part of the great things the great king wants to do in this world. And, and, and Samson's vision was dimmed, and his hair was cut, which was linked to his power in some unknown way. And um, 
He ends up in this tortured chamber, this dungeon. He's, he's going around in circles. They have him shackled. He's, he's grinding grain. Doesn't it feel like someone deleting an app and reinstalling it and deleting an app and reinstalling it and feeling numb on the inside, addicted to porn they don't want to be watching anymore, feeling the cycle of shame, and this is the last time, and just once. He's just going around, and, and his life, it just seems like it's over until he begins to call on God, until some time passes. One of my favorite verses in the Bible it just speaks so much hope to me is Judges 16, 22, which says, but before long, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. And I love it so much because at first, it's just a little bit of hair. It's just a little bit of hair, but soon his hair grows longer. And with time, his hair grows longer. And as it did, he grew stronger. And does it not encourage you to know that his greatest day came after his biggest failure? Samson took out more Philistines in his blind, weakened condition than he ever had, because now he had something he didn't have before, humility. And I wonder if you understand, I'm not trying to paint an unrealistic picture. The divorce might be final, and, and there might be consequences and, and ramifications. I get that. Even forgiven, there are, there are realities. There's a new normal to it. But what I am trying to say is if you are willing to draw that line in the sand, and you are willing to say before, after. And if you're willing to say some of the most important words you'll ever say, and those are from this day forward, from this day forward. The devil wants to keep us locked up to our past because we feel like there's no hope changing it. But when you say, I wish I had, and I wish I hadn't, and I, you know, I can't go back, and I can't undo the wrong, and yeah, I've bound my soul to this person. I've been there, and I can't change that, but so help me from this day forward. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to fight for honor, and it's not going to be perfect, but there's going to be progress. And yeah, I'm going to fall down, but when I fall down, I'm going to get back up. And if I get knocked down again, I'm going to get back up again. The righteous can fall seven times, completely fall, and totally fall. The devil wants to shame you for sins that Christ already paid for, but whom the Son sets free can be free indeed. He wants to wrap you up in his love. He loves you, so he wants to put a ring on your finger and a robe on your shoulder. It doesn't honor God to pay for sins that Jesus already paid for. So receive your forgiveness and say from this day forward, I'm telling you, if Easter teaches us anything. It's that in God's hands, dead things can live. I don't care if your life feels like a valley of dry bones. If you're a church person, I'm talking Ezekiel's vision. If you're not, I'm talking about the elephant graveyard from Lion King. <laughs> but if your life feels desperate, and dry, and there's no way you could possibly get back. I'm telling you, you might feel like the Israelites did in Babylon when they were driven from their home by mistakes, but God in the midst of Babylon wants beauty. He, he told the Israelites, plant some gardens, build a house. I came to tell you, beautify your Babylon. You might not be able to get back to where you wish you were, but by God, you can sow some seed. You can plant some flowers. Come on, beautify your Babylon. Come on, beautify your Babylon. You got to beautify your Babylon. My kids might not talk to me. That's okay. I'm going to beautify my Babylon. I might, I might not be able to talk to this person. I might not be able to go here for some time, but you can beautify your Babylon. There is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. Come on. There is no fear. There is no shame that his love can't cover over. Come on. Let's sing it out. Thank you for joining us for today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give online at elevationchurch.org forward slash give, or you can download the app and select give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more messages like this one.